Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Well, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I'm Eki Tepsapornchai. Well, guys, we have a, a good topic. We've just sort of finished um, a very long series on uh, the qualifications of an elder, and uh, we're busy um, looking at and preparing another short series on false teachers where we're going to kind of pick out uh, specific ones that we think the body needs to be aware of. But that's going to take a little bit more homework on our part, and yeah. uh, really, we just have to suffer through some awful sermons. But anyway... Um, so in the meantime, we'll, we'll have some other, uh, other good episodes, hopefully. And today, I think, uh, what we want to talk about today is really vital. Um, and you know, as society kind of changes, especially thinking of Western Christianity, uh, when, um, yeah, just when the whole dynamics of a society shift, people often are kind of reoriented to the reality of living in a sinful world and where their priorities should be. Um, and so we just kind of want to talk about the necessity to for believers to be heavenly minded um, and just sort of, you know, we, we have in, um these are often sort of off the cuff, but um, yeah, just to kind of talk about the dynamics, what believers should be thinking about, what they shouldn't be thinking about, how you should view your life, how you should view the local church um, in a heavenly minded way. And so I, I think one of the issues, and it'd be interesting to hear from you, Eki, one of the things that I'm a little concerned about when I think of the Western church is how secularized e even the church has become in many ways, right? So we're not talking about people losing their salvation or things yeah. like that, but when you look at even some of the healthiest churches, um, it, it's pretty common to see a large swath of people who are Bible-believing Christians. They love the Lord. They love the church. But when it really comes down to it, there's a lot of worldliness still, right, that that needs to be um, considered and, and even dealt with. And so I think it's a good topic for all of us to uh, to think about. What what are some of the concerns or thoughts that you have when you sort of think about being heavenly minded or secularism in the church? Um, and we're just kind of talking about our circles, you know, the healthier church. We realize, you know, there are plenty of churches that are just like the world. But for for our kind of circles, people who care about godliness and that sort of thing, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I think even in the healthiest churches, we have um, challenges with holding on too tightly to the things of the world. And with this year being an election year, politics is obviously a big deal, uh, growing to be a big deal. And uh, certainly we want to participate in the political process. We want to vote. We want to be informed voters as well. Uh, don't simply just uh, take on what people tell you, but uh, try to be informed about the things that you vote for. Vote for what's good for the country. But at the end of the day, recognize that God is still sovereign regardless of what happens. And uh, I've seen a growing number of churches um, that are otherwise faithful um, really talk about how the church has been fall at fault for the way things have gone in this world, that we have not done enough to convince people to go in the right direction. And uh, I understand that sentiment, and certainly we do bear a responsibility to speak forth the truth, um, to stand up for what is right, but we have to remember first and foremost that we're here to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I mean, it, it's good to vote, um, but don't let that take the place of really eternal realities. And this is what it means to be heavenly minded, because this entire country could be headed downwards. Um, we not might not be able to um, stop or even slow the downward progress that this nation is going through. But we can certainly uh, seek to help as many people as possible to know the Lord Jesus Christ so that they could have a hope that transcends this world, that transcends uh, this reality. And the reality is, in the scriptures, when I look at it, um, I'm convinced that things are going to get worse before they get better. And of course, when when Jesus comes, when the return comes, and um, for me, I do believe there will be a tribulation period as well. I think all those things will happen. And uh, so in one sense, I don't want to say that, hey, forget it all. Don't worry about it all. God's going to burn this place to the ground anyway. I don't want to say that because we are to be light and salt, and we want to care about those who are around us. 
Um, but remember that uh, when the end comes, what we're most concerned about is eternal realities. Yeah, and I think that's a a, a good thing to bring out because, I, I mean, the Bible, we don't just hold on to one truth. I mean, when you're talking about this idea of you know, just kind of, it's it's not that we should just not worry about it because God's in control. We have responsibility. And and those are two truths that we hold on to equally. One is that God is sovereign and he providentially works in and throughout every part of creation yeah. and there's human responsibility. Um, and, and so, yeah. And I think we're talking about politics. I mean, let's just kind of start there since we are in you know, an election year, which I hate election years. Um, they're, they're not fun times, but, um, you know, I, I instantly think of Daniel two twenty one. I would just read it. Um, because I think this is part of being heavenly minded is understanding. If you don't understand how God works in his creation, you're going to be limited in, in, in how heavenly minded you can be right. Because you're, you're going to, we, we already and instantly, have a secular worldview. And so to be truly heavenly minded, you've got to have a biblical worldview. Um, Daniel 2.21 says, and talking about God says, and he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. Um, I mean, so here we see that God is ultimately in charge of what kings and what rulers na uh, nations have. Paul reiterates this in Romans, um, in Timothy, in 1 Timothy, yeah, yeah. Uh, where Paul's uh, mm -hmm. encouraging Timothy to pray for rulers and leaders. We understand that it's God who sets up rulers. And so yep. there, there's this, this tension sometimes in our country with voting. Um, and you'll have some guys who say, well, you know, if you don't vote for the right candidate or right party, you know, then then you're part of the problem. And that, now that could be true if you're yeah. voting uh for sinfulness, right? Um, but the reality is there are two things happening here. We, we have the responsibility as believers to uphold justice, to promote truth and righteousness in every way we can, while simultaneously understanding that our vote could never override what God's ultimate plan is and right. so if God wanted to give a nation a wicked king, our vote wouldn't matter. It's yeah. not going to overthrow that. Um, and, and so I think we have to understand that there's some – there's a little bit of mystery in there in terms of how God's will works with human responsibility, but we have to do both of those things. We, we have to vote according to a biblically informed conscience. Right while understanding that if we get wicked rulers, it's because God is giving us wicked rulers. And so yeah. the, the right way to view that, I think, is to ask the question, not why aren't people voting the way we think they should vote, but why is God giving us wicked rulers, right? Right. And I yeah, think and that's later, a heavenly-minded view. Yeah, and later, later in the book of Daniel, you get to Daniel chapter 9, and Daniel's reading about the 70 years from Jeremiah, and then uh, the Lord ends up revealing the 70 years is, is really 70 weeks of years and, and really goes to show, and the book of Daniel is a great book to show how God is indeed in control of all who are going to come into power, um, timing and endings. I even think of Elijah when he goes to uh, Mount Horeb, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. He goes before the Lord, and the Lord says, uh, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king over Aram, which is Syria. Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And then he goes on to say, It shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. The one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to uh, Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So even in those words, uh, the reason why Elisha, uh, Elijah was running away was because he was worried about Jezebel and what Jezebel might do to him. He was worried about how they had responded uh, to the uh, confrontation he had with the prophets uh, uh, of Baal. He thought that, hey, we had a victory. Why why are, are the people not truly repenting? And, uh, and the Lord just goes to show, look, I'm in charge of all those who are in charge. Uh, I'm even sovereign over the very 
people that you're running away from. I even am sovereign over when they're going to die, how they're going to die, and who's going to replace them. So this is something to always take take to heart. That does not mean that we just turn a blind eye and don't do anything. We do want to stand up for what is good, but do not let it consume you. And and here's a good test um, to to find out if this is consuming you or not. If the election or if the right kind of ruler, if, if you don't get the result that you're hoping for, is it going to send you into despair? Is it going to send you into a, a kind of depression where you're feeling down and discouraged? Because if it is, then I would, then I would say that you're putting too much hope into the things of this world. Um, you should go ahead and stand up for what is right, but when the results come, you know what? Lord, your will be done. Uh, Help guide us to continue to just glorify you and to stand up for what is right and to be children of light. Uh, remember, light shines the brightest when the night is the darkest. And as it gets darker and darker here, um, the light uh, of churches needs to shine brighter and brighter. Yeah, and, and I think and, – and so we have to view all of these things through um, a, a biblical worldview. I mean we do want to be heavenly-minded. Uh, Randy Alcorn made this statement, which is a great statement. He says – Perhaps you're afraid of becoming, quote, so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly, no earthly good, good, right? We yeah, hear that a yeah, lot. Yeah. But he goes on to say, there's another one of Satan's myths. On the contrary, yep. mm -hmm. most of us are so earthly minded that we are no heavenly or earthly good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I and that's a powerful statement. I think he's right. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who we love, says the men who have accomplished the most in this world have always been theologically minded men. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, again, I think when we rightly understand Scripture, it's never to say we just throw our hands up and let the world burn because Christ is coming back, if that's your view. So, uh, but that's that's not at all what what we mean, um, but, we, but we do have to not be shaken by things of this earth. You know, when you think of um, our government and the church and how— I, you know, one of the concerns I have is especially in the, the southern part of the U.S., is practically how patriotism sometimes supersedes the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Now, that might be shocking to for guys to hear. I mean, we both love our country. I yeah. think you should love whatever country God put you in because it was God's ultimate wisdom that put you there. Right. And if he wants you to move, he'll move you or give you opportunities You know, um, to, to do that. And so, we, yeah, we love the country, but ultimately the Bible is not about the United States of America. It's about the kingdom of God and right. of Christ. Um, and so everything we do and how we think needs to be not um, as those who view ourselves primarily as American citizens, but as those who view ourselves as heavenly citizens. And we have brothers and sisters all over the world. Um, they're, they're not American citizens. Some are Ugandan. Some are different countries in Asia. Some are Russian. Some are Ukraine. Some are China. Um, but the one thing that we all have in common is that we're citizens of a heavenly mm -hmm. kingdom. Um, and I think, you know, Jonathan Edwards, he, he wrote, uh, I don't know if it's a book or just a, an article on, um, the journey of a pilgrim. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but I do have a little snippet here and it's a little bit lengthy, but let me just read it because I think this should be the goal of the, the believer. He says, God is the highest good of the reasonable creature and the enjoyment of him is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied to go to heaven fully to enjoy god is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here fathers and mothers husbands and wives children or the company of earthly friends are but shadows but the enjoyment of god is the substance these are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, yeah. but God is the ocean. Therefore, it becomes us to spend this life only as a journey towards heaven. And I think it's a powerful statement because it, it gives us a right worldview. And when you are heavenly minded, I think you find that you become more stable as a person. Yeah. It, yeah. It, the ups and downs, the anxieties, you know, just fade away because you have the right view of what's going on. Um, having a view of God's sovereign hand in all of these things should be one of the greatest comforts we have, right? Because it it lets us know, reaffirms the fact that God's not sitting in heaven looking down, you know, at America or any other country thinking, oh my, what am I going to do now? 
right? I, I wasn't expecting this guy to get in or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, no, he's in absolute charge of that. And to the degree we are heavenly minded, I think um, will be the degree to which we find our greatest joy here on earth. Yeah, if the Apostle Paul had a life mantra, he probably wrote it in Philippians one twenty one, when he wrote, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in the Greek, it's um, phrased a lot more simply, um, to live Christ, to die gain. And he's writing to Philippians, people who had the highest colonial status within the Roman Empire. So they were treated as if they were citizens that are born on Roman soil. And he tells them in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, your citizenship is in heaven. And he writes with a certain credibility here that from the fact that he himself is actually a Roman citizen from Roman soil. He's not one that was born in, in a colony with the highest colonial status. And, and they know from his experience. Uh, in fact, I just preached a message last week called, What Must I Do to Be Saved? And that was the exact uh, question that the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas after the earthquake hit, and, and he realized that they had, not, they had not escaped, but actually they voluntarily stayed behind just so that they can bring salvation to the Philippian jailer and ultimately to the church at Philippi. And uh, Paul himself, though he was of Roman citizenship, um, allowed himself to be falsely accused, to be beaten, to be imprisoned uh, with stocks. So he allowed himself to be mistreated in every way possible, and it was only after he witnessed the gospel to the Philippian jailer and his household that uh, when the magistrates came and tried to uh, tell Paul, hey, just, just leave us alone, uh, Paul said, no, you guys have mistreated a Roman citizen. I'm going to do as I please. So he only revealed his Roman citizenship after he had actually brought the gospel to someone. And so that is a great example of someone who had the, the, the most valuable citizenship. He's addressing a church that has the highest colonial status, as if they were born on Roman soil. And he is writing with credibility when he says to live as Christ and to die as gain, and reminding them that their citizenship is ultimately not in Rome, but it's in heaven. Yeah, and I think this is why it's important what happens in a church, right? Um, what's being taught, what's being preached, uh, you know, what kind of um, activities are being facilitated in the church, um, even just down to how the church is decorated. I mean, I've been in churches where, I mean, it was just all kinds of beautiful worldly art um, that would be great in someone's home, but the feel um, had very little of anything to do with something that represented a heavenly kingdom. Right. I mean, so when you go into the church, everything in the church, I'm convinced, should remind you of the kingdom of heaven and nothing yeah. should remind you of an earthly kingdom. Um, I, I want to get into some scripture. I mean, because over and over again, the scriptures point us to a heavenly mindset yeah. rather than a worldly one. And again, we, you know, we'll probably say this multiple times. We're not saying we don't participate here. Right. We're to be faithful, but we do it with the view that we are sojourners here, we are pilgrims yeah. here, and so we're as faithful as we can be, but we're on the way to somewhere else, yeah. right? A, a better kingdom, our true um, our true kingdom. First uh, John 2, 15, 17, I, I mean, there's so many passages like this. John says, do not love the world, nor the mm -hmm. things in the world. I mean, that's pretty clear. Yeah. He goes on to say, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For mm. all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away and also no. its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Now, I, he's not saying we don't enjoy God's common graces in this world. But it, if if we're looking at the world around us, the tangible, physical world around us, and that's where we're finding our greatest joy and comfort, and you know, that's what happens in our world if that determines our how anxious we are or how how at peace we are, then we're missing the point, right? Mm -hmm. We're we're missing God's view of uh, of of reality. Um, th this is just part of reality, right? How uh, we're living here on this earth in the country we're living in. Um, yeah. It's not the full picture. Matthew 6, 33, I mean here, but mm -hmm. seek first yeah. his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And he's just finished talking about 
the necessities of life, right? Um, what you will wear, what you're going to eat, your yep. shelter. And it's interesting because he hits on these two or three things. Let me just actually go there. Um, and these are things that 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 men spend their whole lives pursuing, right? Um, working to the bones. I mean, you, you've got to work to eat and things like that. But, you know, he's talking about your your basic necessities. And he's saying, look, seek God's kingdom first, right? We're, we're faithful. You've got to work, but you've got to be heavenly minded. And he just goes on to say, look, your heavenly father will provide all these things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just over and over again in scripture, we find this emphasis on you live here, but this is not your home. This is not your permanent residence, as it were, right? <clears throat> yeah, and it's early in that chapter. He says, um, "Build up your treasures in heaven, uh, where your treasures essentially won't uh, won't fade away. They won't they won't be destroyed. Rather than build up treasures here on earth." And Peter builds on that in First Peter one, when he's writing to a group of Christians who are concerned about the persecution that was started from Nero against Christians in Rome over a fire that they did not start. <laughs> So he writes to them, and what does he say? He, he he reminds them that they are blessed because they are saved, and that they have an inheritance awaiting them that is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, and protected in heaven, uh, waiting for a salvation to be, to be revealed in the last time. So the, we see these reminders not only in the words of Jesus Christ, but also Peter. And then even earlier in Matthew chapter 6 um, is the Lord's Prayer, where the Lord gives us an example of prayer, and he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So those that statement right there, thy, thy will be done, that's really a prayer for us to want what God wants. But often we start to behave as if we want God to want what we want, right? So we have to stop and think, okay, is this really what God wants? And I think a lot of the worldliness that we see in the church, now we, we've talked about politics and just overall priorities, but it shows up in things like, for instance, music, right? I mean, so I know that there's yeah. a, a real love for contemporary Christian music, and there are some really good songs out there. But um, recognize that a lot of contemporary Christian music, its its design and purpose is to sound as secular as possible and to water down the lyrics as much as possible so that the theology is not very deep, right? I just got into a conversation uh, with uh, one of our church members um, that uh, she brought up the song In the Garden, which is an old hymn uh, that's from a long time ago. And it's a very popular hymn. A lot of people sing it. But when you look at it, um, it, it sounds kind of like a, a mushy love song. And, uh, you know, aside from the direct mentions uh, of God, you wouldn't know or learn anything about God just from hearing or, or reading that the, the lyrics to that song. And I think that's the case for a lot of contemporary Christian music today. You look at the lyrics, and you don't really learn anything, um, anything new about God, anything that that's that's deep, or anything that that helps anchor your understanding of the gospel or the attributes of God. So that's another area where I think we can be over secular. Is that even in our worship, we we start to we start to reject the things that are deeper, more theological, more true, in favor for what sounds better to our ears, and in the process, bringing in lyrics that really don't say a whole lot about God and oftentimes are really centered upon ourselves. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. And I mean, back to the fact that what we do in, you know, especially on the Lord's day, what we do in the church on the Lord's day is meant to yeah. be a shadow of what we're going to spend eternity doing in heaven. And so everything that happens there from the music to, I mean, just everything ought to as best as we can, reflect one god's command for how he wants to be worshiped is we don't get to worship no. god the way we want to church isn't about you it's about god right, you know worship right. isn't about what we want um it, it's not about giving everyone their own preferences it's about worship in a way that you know god would look upon and be pleased um but yeah everything in the church it should feel quite different then when you go out into the world, so the music yeah. should be different. The, 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 the preaching should be different. Um, the atmosphere should be different. I mean, I would argue that the church people ought to come to the Lord's day and be so it, and it be so different than what you experience yeah. in the world, that it's a breath of fresh air. Right. And right. it takes hard work to do that because you, you've got to, 
um, you've got to ask the hard questions. Where are we too secular in the church? You know, what yeah. things, you know, are, are we not quite where, uh, are, are there things where we're not quite in line with scripture? And and you're always asking these questions, right? As we grow in, in spirituality and health. Um, it, you mentioned Peter. Let me go to second Peter. I mean, just, I, I want to, I want to just give a lot of scripture for this kind of mentality in Peter in second Peter three 13 says, but according to his promises, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which yeah. righteousness dwells. And, and again, this is what we're looking forward to in the very next verse in second Peter three 14, he says, therefore beloved, since you are looking for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Yeah. And so again, the focus is on our, looking towards and looking forward uh, to heavenly things. I mean, Jesus in the Beatitudes, um, yep. I mean, in Matthew 5, uh, let, let, actually, let me just go there. Um, I, I love this because, you know, here's here's Jesus speaking about basically being persecuted. Mm -hmm. um, he's just after, the, let, let me just read this little section here. So he starts in verse 3 with the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comfort. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I mean, all yeah. these are heavenly focused. Blessed right. are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The pure in heart, for they shall see God. The peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And he goes on and on. And then in verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, no. for theirs is... Not an earthly reward, but the kingdom of heaven. Yep. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, verse 12 is where I really wanted to get to. So he goes through all of this. He's talking about suffering and being persecuted. And you would expect he might say lots of things. Find comfort in the gathering of believers. Find comfort in encouraging one another. Find comfort in prayer. And and some of these we do find in Scripture as well, but that's not where he focuses the disciples here. He says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Yeah. And so he's saying in the midst of life's difficulties and suffering here, our focus ought to be that this is temporary um, because our reward is in heaven, right? I mean, that's an entirely different mindset. Yeah. And, and it's so easy for all of us. You don't want to make it sound like, you know, I, I'm not as heavenly minded as I want to be. And you probably would admit the same. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we're growing in that area. And we live in a secular world. So this isn't something that you get right and then you never have to fight against again. Right. Um, Right. I mean, you constantly have to guard yourself from being worldly. And I think the heart that longs to be in heaven and understands that we're pilgrims here, you know, will constantly want to fight that battle. Yeah. You know, we've been citing numerous references from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And really, the entire Sermon on the Mount is a great reminder of what it means to be heavenly minded from Matthew chapter five all the way to Matthew chapter seven. We've already gone through diff three different uh, spots in chapter six. You just started this off in chapter five, and and recognize that in this sermon, Jesus is addressing um, primarily the nation of Israel, people who thought that the kingdom of heaven belonged to them simply by being sons of Abraham. And he starts off not by saying, blessed are those who are physically sons of a Abraham, but blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So he goes on listing all these characteristics to go to show that no, it's not simply uh, it's not simply being sons of Abraham, and certainly just being sons of Abraham is not going to get you there. And how does he end the message? Well, I mean, the last the last serious warning he has comes in Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And of course, he describes many different people who will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not perform many miracles? And then I said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then at the conclusion of this sermon, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. What is the rock? The rock is his words. It's it's his counsel. It's his wisdom here. 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And and that that's how he ends that sermon. So all of this to say that, you know, if you are pursuing the things of this world, you're, you're pursuing things that are nothing more than wood, hay, and stubble. But if you are building up treasures in heaven and you're living with a heavenly mindset, then you're going to have a reward in heaven that can never be taken away, and you're also going to be glorifying God, and also you're going to gr- lend greater credibility to your witness of Christ, because they will know you as someone who is not swayed by the things of this world, but rather you your hope is in something that is firm and sure, and and a hope that's coming in the future. Yeah, and I think, you know, as we kind of close this out, um, let, let's just talk about some practical ways you, you can, one, either— kind of gauge, you know, where you become more secular and less heavenly minded and what do you do about that? Right. And I I think for me, and I I post this on social media, I mean, nearly every day um, is from first Corinthians. uh, Let me pull it up. 10 31, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 31 or 32. Yeah. 31. Um, You know, Paul says to the Corinthians, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I, I really post that every day just for me um, as, as a reminder yeah. that I should be thinking about the things I'm doing and why I'm doing them. And I think that's one way to become more heavenly minded is just get in the habit of rehearsing in your mind, you know, am I doing, is God being glorified by what I'm doing? Is God right. being glorified through what I'm watching? Is God, can God be glorified in how I view church um is god being glorified in how i speak to my wife or how mm-hmm. i treat my husband um that's just a very practical thing to do uh to 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 kind of reorient ourselves to being heavenly minded it, you want to add kind of kind of close this up on on some some ways that um people can just sort of reorient themselves obviously being in the word is a big part yeah. of that yeah. but what are what are some practical things people can do um just just to sort of remind themselves that this is not our home, right? We are just here for yeah. a short time. Right, right. I, and I often go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 24, which uh, we're called not to walk as Gentiles. And Paul gives us a description of how Gentiles walked. And what you see is repeated descriptions of how they are fruitless in their mind and in their hearts and in their desires. And then Paul goes on to remind the Ephesians, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard of him and you've been taught in him as Jesus is in the truth, and then he goes on to talk about putting off and putting on, that's verse 22, you lay aside the old man, verse 24, you put on the new man, which uh, which is created in the righteousness of Christ, but in verse 23, to be renewed by the spirit of your mind. I think on a daily basis, we have to remind ourselves who we belong to, and how that happened, and why are we to be thankful, right? The, the gospel never ceases to be great in the hearts of those who are maturing. When you go to Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and that's the scene in heaven, and you see the worship of the throne in chapter 4, and then you see the worship of the Lamb in chapter 5, even when you read the praises of the of the creatures and the elders and the angels of Jesus Christ, recognizing him not only as the lamb, and by the way, when we see lamb, it's a reminder that he sacrificed himself for us, but that he also purchased for himself a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and made them to be a kingdom of priests uh, to our God. And so when you look at these verses, it is a reminder that we have a new purpose, and we have a new purpose because of a great and wonderful work that our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus Christ is reigning from up on heaven at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ is the sovereign over all. Jesus Christ, for the time being, is withholding judgment out of patience, giving us this opportunity to be able to witness Christ to the world. And so for the time being, we just have to remind ourselves what our purpose is. And then when we remember what Jesus Christ did for us, it should produce in us a heart of thanksgiving, a heart of joy, and a heart that is ready to do whatever the Lord calls us to do in order to fulfill His will here upon earth. Yeah, amen. I, I think the last thing I would leave people with, j- just another good extra biblical resource that I think paints this mindset so well is Pilgrim's Progress. Mm. Um, I, I I read it every year. 
every year it it just reminds me that our life here is just a journey in which we're meant to display yeah. and bring glory to God through our life, um, through witnessing the truth of the gospel of Christ to those around us and living faithful. Um, but we're on the way to the celestial city. We're we're on the way, right, to where our true citizenship is. And so if you haven't Amen. read Pilgrim's Progress, you need to read that book. Um, and if you've read it, read it again. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. so, so good. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it's just an allegory. It's it's not scripture. It's not authoritative. But it's such a good picture of um, of just what it takes to to go through this life facing various trials and tribulations. And, you know, Pilgrim in the book, his focus is is to get to the celestial city faithful. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, and, and so it just sort of helps. I think uh, it's a good, easy read. So be in scripture. Think about, you know, just rehearse in your mind day to day. What what can I it is what I'm doing rather bringing glory to God in some way. And God's glorified in all sorts of things we do. Right. God can be glorified in in just eating a meal. Um, yeah. You go out with friends, you eat a meal. Are you doing it with a thankful heart? Right. Right. I mean, just little things like that. So, you, I mean, you, you have to kind of think through and use some common sense and reason in these things. Um, but the more often you're thinking to yourself, how can I glorify God today? Uh, I, I think you'll find yourself decreasing in secular, uh, uh, in secularization and increasing in your heavenly mindedness. So, Amen. Yeah. And don't just read uh, Pilgrim's Progress, but watch the animated adaptation of it. It's actually quite good. You can watch it with the family, um, read it first and then go over the film and you can pause and talk about what you're seeing and reminding them what they read. Um, so no, those are all great reminders. And that's, uh, you know, that's from church history. Uh, there's much that we can learn from church history. You can read uh, from the accounts of the martyrs, read from great men of the past, even people who are more recent, like Martin Lloyd-Jones. Um, his book on preaching and preachers uh, is a, is just a great um, exposition of um, of having this heavenly mindset for us as ministers, but I think everyone who reads it will be will be enriched by it as well. Amen. Well, guys, I hope that this episode has been helpful for you. As always, uh, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All that information is in the show notes. Um, love to get an email from you if you'd like to hear certain topics, or if you just want to share a testimony of how uh, one of these podcast episodes has been helpful to you, we'd love to hear from you. So until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.